You're listening to the Cancer Assist Podcast. Wherever you are in your experience, we are here to provide help and hope as you navigate cancer prevention, treatment, and care. Hosted by Dr. Bill Evans and brought to you by the Cancer Assistance Program. Help when you really need it. Welcome to the Cancer Assist Podcast with your host, Dr. Bill Emmons. Uh, today, we're going to be talking with Dr. Kostescu about cervical screening. But uh, just before we start our conversation, I'd like to remind listeners that the Cancer Assist Podcast is brought to you by the Cancer Assistance Program based here in Hamilton, Ontario. Uh, CAP, which we affectionately call it, provides a variety of free services to cancer patients, including free rides, equipment loans, nutritional and incontinence supplies, among other services. And the podcast is made possible by generous donations from individuals in the community who hope, as I do, that by learning more about cancer, its causes, treatment, and the supports available in the community will make the challenge of dealing with cancer just a little easier. So I'm delighted to uh, welcome Dr. Kostescu to the uh, program today. He's uh, uh, an associate professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at McMaster University. Um, it says you do family planning and you're a generalist. Uh, I think that means that you're involved in many aspects yes. of gynecological care and obstetrical care for your patients. And I'm really, really glad to have you uh, with us today. I know also you have a role with Cancer Care Ontario uh, in the cervical screening program provincially. So we want to touch on all those things. But a great place to start is maybe just a little bit about your background. Maybe tell us a bit about yourself. Sure. Yeah, you know, I think the first thing somebody asks, uh, you know, a male gynecologist is like, why do you do this, right? In the colposcopy clinic, you're doing PAPs and they think, why, you know, why are you, why are you here sitting on the other side of the, the chair? Uh, you know, all of the big role models in my life have been women, uh, surrounded by powerful women all my life, starting with my mom, uh, and just always been passionate about women's health. Uh, you know, we all go into medicine to quote unquote help people, um, but really gender inequity has always been a passion of mine and realizing that, you know, focusing on women's health was a way to, you know, help uh, right some other wrongs. Um, and so from very early on in medical school, I was really interested in it. Uh, you know, gynecology being sort of one of my first loves, it's it's great surgery, really impactful on quality of life. And then as I moved through, I realized I, I loved many other aspects of it. You know, if I'm going to be up in the middle of the night delivering a baby, 4,000 in never gets old, um, you know, and uh, in long hours. Um, and actually cervical cancer screening and colposcopy, which we'll, you know, touch upon what those things are later, have, have also become you know, passions of mine. I, I often call this my second love, you know, just uh, sexual health kind of being the, the first one. But, uh, you know, we have a condition that's, you know, very common worldwide that we almost never see in Ontario because we have a good screening program. And while the tests, you know, are uncomfortable and for some patients, you know, invasive, you know, they, they really do reduce the risk of developing a cervical cancer, you know, which has a, a much more profound impact. Um, and, you know, it, those brief encounters with patients, you know, are, are really positive ones too. And, and you get to meet lots of people along the way. And so, yeah, I, a, I enjoy all story. of those things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's how I got here. <laughs> Interesting, the first thing you said, you're surrounded by powerful women, yeah. influential women, and that was a driving force in you going in this direction. And you do a lot of family planning, I gather, as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, my work is in, inherently political, I, I often say. But at the same time, you know, it's 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 the reality of, of the patients that we see, right? You know, helping patients to have a, a baby when they're ready and, and not have a baby when they're not ready is important. Uh, you know, cervical cancer, you know, is another good example of how that, that takes away people's reproductive agency or autonomy. You know, if you have a treatment that requires radiation and you can't use your uterus or, you know, hysterectomy and, and cervix cancer can affect, you know, younger patients of reproductive age, you know, we, we, we lose that from them, right? And so, you know, prevention has benefits not just for, you know, their overall mortality, but their significant quality of life issues, you know, and being able to maintain someone's reproduction and fertility if that's something they want to do later in life. That's right. Now, in, in my reading and preparation for this, I was actually surprised to find out that cervical cancer is the fourth most common cancer in women worldwide mm -hmm. and the fourth highest mortality rate among cancers in women. So we tend not to think of it as that common or important uh, in this part of the world for the reasons that you just said. So we'll want to talk about the screening program in the province. But before we get there, let's let's introduce our listeners to a little bit of anatomy sure. <laughs> so that they can actually understand what cervical cancer is, where the cervix is, and 
how you go about um, diagnosing a, yeah. a cancer. Yeah, that, that's great. Um, so yeah, a little bit of anatomy 101. So so the uterus or the womb uh, we sometimes call is, is you know where periods come from and where babies grow inside. And the opening to that at the very top end of the vagina, the sort of the inside part, is called the cervix. And so a lot of us kind of know the cervix because it's, uh, you know, the part of the pap test, obviously, but also it's the thing that dilates when you know, when a baby comes out. And so those are the, the two interactions, you know, folks have with the healthcare system when we're, we're worried about a cervix. Um, we've known for many, many years now that, that cervical cancers, um, you know, have precursor cells, little bits of them that give us hints that there can be the development of cancer. Um, or that we can detect, you know, cancer cells if we do certain uh, tests, pap smear being the, the main one. Um, and so we know that cervical cancers themselves uh, grow rather silently. So some cancers really scream at us um, and other parts of the female reproductive system, it's very obvious. So, you know, uterine cancers or cancers of the endometrium usually present with bleeding or other symptoms. Um, but we know cervix is kind of more like ovarian in the sense that you may not really know you're having symptoms until there's an obvious cancer and that's why we need to screen um, so that we can treat patients when they're asymptomatic before anything happens. So just to create a bit of a visual picture for mm -hmm. people, like the, the cervix is kind of the, the mouth of the uterus, right? And yeah. there's a little small opening in it most of the time. Mm -hmm. right? And that's that's where intercourse sperm would travel up yeah. to go inside the womb. And, and so it's important to have that sort of visual picture of this sort of circular uh, body at mm -hmm. the end of the, of the uterus, because that's where the, the, the cancers we're trying to yeah. detect early are going to arise from. And the little passageway, the uh, endocervical canal, they can arise in there, and it leads to two different types of cervical cancer, yeah. one more common than the other. But, um, so it's, it's relatively rare in our jurisdiction, but are there, are there subsets of people who are getting cervical cancer because of lack of awareness or other barriers, uh, cultural and what have yeah. you, that that are, are the people we should be trying to reach, particularly yeah. with the podcast? Like yeah, this? that's a really great question. Uh, maybe I'll start with the group where we, we tend to worry about actually isn't at that higher risk. Uh, you know, cervical cancer is sort of a, a problem of overscreening and underscreening. Patients want a lot of testing done when maybe they don't need it, uh, which leads to other interventions that they don't need, but also, you know, the disease disproportionately affects patients who are under or never screened, so they, they've not had a pap test. Um, so people often worry about family history. You know, I have a loved one who's had a cervix cancer or pre-cancer. Do I need to be worried? And, and this is actually not a cancer that runs in families. So um, the reason that, that patients, folks develop cervix cancer is, is infection with HPV. So this is a, a virus. I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more uh, in a second. But... Um, there are certain risk factors for it, um, but really what we know is it's more about whether you get screened or not. And so certain populations have a tendency to be under screened in, in the, the general population. We know um, that racialized individuals are less likely to access healthcare services, less li likely to have a primary care provider like a family doctor to do the POPs. Um, some of them may have cervical screening as part of their um, you know, immigration intake, but uh, some of them will come to the country not having ever been screened, and so they may already be behind um, the eight ball. So newcomer populations we tend to, to worry about a little bit too because they may have you know, sort of not been used to interactions with this type of healthcare system before, may not understand a test that's never been provided in their country of origin. We know Indigenous folks also are more likely to be, uh, or less likely to be screened, more likely to be underscreened, um, and that includes both on reserve as well as urban Indigenous uh, populations. Again, you know, due to historical, um, you know, uh, distrust and colonial violence in the healthcare system. Um, and the third group we, we tend to worry a lot about are um, our queer and uh, transgender individuals with the cervix as well. So we know um, lesbian and bisexual, uh, you know, cisgender women are less likely to be screened. They're actually more likely to be uh, found at a later stage and to report poor health outcomes on the cervical cancer treatment and recovery journey um, than um, straight women. And we know that uh, transgender men have difficulty risk stratifying, understanding their risk. Um, and so although it's a small population, uh, we know that they're also less likely to be, be screened. And so, you know, we, we even reflect that in our language in Ontario, you know, that if you have a cervix and you've ever been sexually active, you need to be screened um, for that reason. So <clears throat> the risk factors that uh, uh, increase one's concern, shall we say, for a cervical cancer, um, you mentioned the, the virus, uh, the human papilloma virus. Um, 
and there are other risk factors, and I guess they kind of interrelate in a way, yeah. don't they? Because the number of sexual partners probably increases your risk of being exposed to HPV, which is the short form we'll use yeah. for human papillomavirus because it doesn't necessarily trip off the tongue yeah. easily. And even there, uh, as I understand it, there are subtypes of virus. It's not all of the human papillomavirus. There's a whole bunch of different types, and they have numbers. And some with certain numbers are <laughs> place individuals at higher risk. Yeah. I think. Yeah, absolutely. So, so HPV is a really interesting virus. Um, and I, I wear a, another hat in my my other job as a sexual health specialist, right? And so, so I often say this to to people, you know. If you would be a virus, like be a sexually transmitted infection, right? Everyone has sex, right? You you hide out, nobody knows that you're there, and you pass it on to other people. And so this virus, this family, has become very efficient at doing that, right? Um, and people, you know, when they hear number of sexual partners, you know, they often again, we have a habit of sort of misunderstanding our own health behavior risks, right? So if you have two sexual partners in your lifetime, you have about a 50% chance of having an exposure to HPV within your lifetime. Uh, in your 20s, 24% of patients will acquire a new strain of HPV every year. Um, and so, you know, these numbers are very high. And, and actually, you know, let's let's be honest with, with listeners, right? If you look at, um, you know, boomers, Gen Xers, and millennials, they would report that, you know, average number of lifetime sexual partners that would be normal for them would be anywhere from about 8 to 12. So we're already talking about, you know, a very high probability that you've seen HPV um, in your lifetime. And what I often say to patients is, you know, if you are not your partner's only ever partner and they're your only ever partner, you probably have had HPV, right? And and so, there, you know, there's nothing to worry about, nothing to be ashamed of. You know, from a public health perspective, when we, we sort of look at this from a, a big lens, you know, we can't really tell the public to have sex with fewer people, right? Because you don't know who you're going to meet till you meet the right person. That doesn't work in terms of messaging. We know actually, you know, abstinence-only education actually promotes higher risk behavior because people don't know how to protect themselves, right? We know that condoms may help a little bit, but in the long run, probably don't really reduce that lifetime exposure um, to HPV. Uh, we know smoking cessation can help, obviously, but we don't really know whether that translates to a reduction in the number of cervix cancers, right? Because it's really about getting screened or not screened. And so, you know, smoking is a risk, but it may may reflect other sort of social risks that put you in, in the way of not, not having a family doctor or not getting, um, not getting screened. Um, so HPV is this sort of interesting family, right? Think of your own family, right? You've got cousins that are pretty boring and indolent, and you've got cousins who create a lot of conflict, right? And so those guys, those are the uh, oncogenic strains, we call them, or the high-risk um, HPV strains. So um, you know, the way I think about this is, you know, we have different tests for, for different things, and, and I tend to use donuts a lot as an analogy. So so if we think of a, a jelly donut, if that jelly itself, you know, being, you know, the cancer of a cervix, right? When we're doing a pap test, all we're doing is taking the powdered sugar and looking for signs that that might be the case, right? Um, so that tells us that there's cell changes. We're already in the process of making this donut. This donut might become, a, a, you know, a jelly donut. Sometimes they get clever and, you know, do Boston cream instead. And so it's really nothing to worry about, right? But every once in a while we make a, a jelly donut out of it. Um, you know, HPV, what we can look for in testing is really, you know, do we have some of the ingredients in there that, you know, could become, you know, a jelly donut, right? So do we have pectin? Do we have, you know, gelatin? Do we have food dye or something? Doesn't mean every time we use these ingredients that you'll get, you know, the end result. But, you know, if you don't have that in your recipe, we know you can't make a jelly donut. You can't make cervix cancer. And so I do find the sillier the analogies, obviously, the, the more it kind of works. Um, I just hope the yeah. listeners aren't going to be confused that if they eat too many donuts, no, some exactly. of these ingredients no. are going to get cervix you know, cancer. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be a good doctor if I said eat a jelly donut every day, but you know, I would certainly support you and understand if you, if you did. Um, but really, yeah, so when we're talking about this you know, it's important to know there's low risk strains that really don't do anything. I mean, they can cause uh, genital warts, for example, but, you know, from a cancer risk, we're not worried. And then there are these other viruses that you may or may not clear on your own, but that still have the potential to, to cause cancer. And so, you know, that that's really shifted dramatically our understanding of this disease, right? Uh, both in terms of understanding that cervix cancer is, in fact, a sexually transmitted, you know, disease. Um, but also understanding that, you know, there might be better tests and maybe other prevention strategies like vaccination, for example, that, that might lower someone's lifetime risk of getting cervix cancer, you know, beyond beyond just screening. I think many listeners might find it um, interesting, if not surprising, that a virus causes cancer. I guess when I started in oncology, um, we were just sort of awakening to the idea mm -hmm. that there were pathogens um, that caused cancer. It wasn't just sort of 
sunlight, radiation, yeah. um, and the unknown, uh, that there are a lot of uh, viruses, and, and this is a particular family of viruses that can cause cancer, uh, just like we have others that cause lymphoma and yeah. uh, stomach cancer from certain bacteria, et cetera. Yeah. So it, it's, it's interesting how our knowledge has expanded on some of the pathogens that are, when I say pathogens, these are organisms that are mm -hmm. in our environment that we get exposed to that can, can cause cancer. So, it, 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 and, and the fact that there are specific subtypes, like they have those numbers 16, 18, 31, uh, it sounds odd that they have these numbers, but nonetheless, yeah. they're, they're, they're the principal bad actors, the bad cousins mm -hmm. that you're referencing there. And are they more prevalent, or, or what's, you know, what's the proportion yeah, of all the a, HPV infections that people would get with their various sexual partners? It yeah, is, uh, that's a good question. Yeah. And, and, you know, the studies are a little bit mixed on this, because some of the studies, basically, basically these are what are called surveillance studies. So, you know, lovely volunteers at the time of just getting a routine pap, you know, in a large population, it could be an entire clinic, or it could just be looking at, you know, a state with a, an organized screening program, just looking at kind of what are the, the total numbers of these, uh, you know, HPV results. Um, we, we know that about um, about four to five percent of patients probably have a high risk or an oncogenic strain of HPV kind of right now that's going on. Um, we know that most strains that actually patients get infected with are, are low risk strains. Um, when we subdivide it out a little bit further, it, it works out to about kind of 50-50, you know, whether people have kind of low high risk strains when they're in a screening program. But that already means that we've detected something that needs, you know, further follow up like a low grade PAP or, you know, some low grade changes on, on the cervix. And so it does vary a little bit that way. Um, we know also just that the more exposures you have, the more likely it is that you are to acquire new strains. And so many many patients actually will have more than one strain of HPV if they have a larger number of, of sexual partners or just over, over many years. Um, the other reality is that, you know, you and your partner can pass the same infection back and forth. And so you may become HPV negative again, but then, then get reinfected and then, and then have that. Um, and I think probably just important to mention at this point too, you know, we talk about infection, but but these are asymptomatic. So, you know, you don't know you have it. There aren't really other symptoms you're going to have. This isn't something that you would knowingly transmit, you know, to another partner. Um, for low-risk HPV, you know, yeah, you know, exactly. Yeah. yeah, you wouldn't notice anything like that. They're not like the bacterial infections like chlamydia, gonorrhea that really uh, scream at you. Um, the exception being genital warts. Uh, which again are a low risk strain. So, you know, having warts wouldn't actually put you at risk of a cervix cancer. It just means you've been exposed to, um, to HPV. Um, technically, HPV is a skin uh, virus. Uh, you know, it just happens to be covering genital skin and that's how it gets transmitted. But we can see other cancers, you know, on the skin, uh, other genital skin cancers like the, the vulva, the vagina, uh, the penis as well. And then we know also because of exposure, um, certain head and neck cancers are also um, HPV related. And so, um, you know, like I said, it's a sneaky, um, sneaky cousin that, that shows up at the family reunion. <laughs> <laughs> the cousin you didn't want to yeah, attend, Exactly. Right? So maybe just a few words about how people might present with cervical cancer mm -hmm. and then we'll sort of dive yeah. into the screening yeah, so itself. I definitely think that's important because when we talk about the screening program, we're really talking about asymptomatic, low-risk individuals not having any gynecologic complaints or anything like that. Um, and the flip to that is that cervix cancer, you know, the symptoms and signs can mimic a lot of other gynecologic conditions. And so the key is just to keep it on the radar. It's also, you know, important to keep it on the radar of the, the primary care provider who's doing the exam, uh, you know, and the gynecologist as, as well. And so you know, the most common symptoms we see are irregular bleeding because the lesion on the cervix itself can, can bleed. And it also is t uh, prone to what's called contact bleeding. So usually that bleeding can be made worse uh, with intercourse uh, or provocation of some sort. So people have irregular bleeding, but they notice that bleeding is worse, you know, after intimacy or something has been inserted into, into the vagina. Um, pelvic pain also can be um, a finding um, of cervix cancer. And so again, you know, for, for listeners who maybe have, you know, fibroids or polyps or endometriosis, they might say, well, this kind of sounds like you know, what I experience all the time, right? And so, you know, part of the investigation of being worked up for these conditions is to make sure you're up to date um, with your screening. It doesn't mean patients with those gynecologic issues are more likely to um, to develop a cervix cancer. Yeah. So um, the whole thing about screening is to try and prevent a cancer. And, mm -hmm. and there aren't that many opportunities we have to prevent other than good public health measures. But in terms of screening programs, mm -hmm. we're... We're, uh, there's not many that actually prevent cancer. There's some that detect early. Yeah. And that's been the main thrust, say, for breast cancer and um, 
and um, I was going to say colorectal, but actually we can prevent some colorectal yeah. cancers by finding polyps and removing them. But here's one where we can actually um, detect at a, a time when it's not yet a cancer yeah. and take action. So maybe talk a bit about what is actually done in a screening test. Yeah, perfect. That's uh, that's a great question. And I think, you know, some listeners and, and sometimes in the public, you know, there is a lot of uh, skepticism around the concept of screening, right? And, and a lot of people like to use the concept of a lead time bias as, a, as an excuse why screening doesn't really change, you know, outcomes. But in, in comparative studies, in studies where we introduce screening programs into populations and when we introduce organized screening programs, which is sort of these like high quality screening programs, you know, we see very dramatic reduction in the, in the incidence of cervix cancer. Um, and, you know, one of the key factors to success of a screening program is you have to have what's called a true precancerous lesion, something you know you treat that's not cancer, that if you didn't treat would become cancer. And so we have that. Um, in cervical cancer, and so we're, I wouldn't say we're we're lucky because obviously we don't wish on anyone, but but you know we we have the opportunity really to screen and and to find uh, to find things. Um, so so that's really important for us. So um, in Ontario currently we have the the cervical screening test we do is called a, a Pap test. You know colloquially Pap and Nicolau you know first discovered this, uh, although some other people did probably around the same time, uh, but he's credited for for the test is and the fancy name for us we call this a cervical cytology. So um, an HPV infection will exist and over many many years that infection will very slowly chip away at our immune system and those cervical cells if they're constantly exposed will then develop what's called dysplasia or precancerous changes some of which are low grade and some of which are high grade and it's these high grade ones that have the potential you know uh, over many more years from there and we're talking you know 10 to 20 years from that initial infection so really this long is, time this is really important yeah it's not like you know Cancer develops exactly. quickly. It's, it's yeah. a very long process yeah. from yeah. the infection to the early changes that you could see by scraping exactly. the surface of the cervix. Yeah. And, and even for those high grade changes, you know, it still probably takes, uh, you know, two to five years for those even to become cancer. So we have li many opportunities over many screens to find patients where they're, they're showing signs of the development of what we call dysplasia or precancerous changes. And so, um, you know, unfortunately, because we really need to get the cells themselves off of the cervix, we do do what's called a speculum exam. So I know any, any listeners had it knows exactly what this is. And probably some of the, you know, the men in the audience are probably not quite sure what, you know, what's involved but basically the doctor will you know briefly examine the outer parts of the genitals um, and then insert a small instrument in um, and there are different sizes so it's important for patients you know if you find paps uncomfortable to to talk to your clinician about you know using the right instrument for you and and how to make the process a little bit easier um, but what we have to do is visualize the cervix right at the back of the, of the vagina um, first thing we do is a visual inspection so we just want to make sure we don't see any lumps bumps lesions ulcers or anything that could be worrisome um, and then uh, a pap test is taken and, and there's a couple of different ways that we do that but basically a small little broom is used a little plastic broom or in some places a small uh, wooden spatula is used kind of looks like a popsicle stick and we're just basically taking just the little cells off of the top of the cervix. Um, the analogy I use is if you rub your, your arm, you know, really quickly and a little bit of skin cells fall off, that's all we're, we're doing um, with that. Now, those cells get sent off to a lab and somebody spins them and looks at them and then we look for, for the changes that we see. Um, if, a, if a doctor or the person doing the test sees something abnormal on the uh, cervix, they may send you for further testing at that time. Um, but most people will go on for further testing based on the results of that PAP test. Um, and so in Ontario, that test is done every three years. Okay. And, and when do you use acetic acid? On the yeah, that's a good the, question. Uh, yeah. So, so different countries use, uh, do different strategies. And so, so vinegar, acetic acid, literally the kind of thing you can get at the grocery store or, you know, uh, you know, $4 for a, a jug at Costco or whatever is, is actually been shown, you know, worldwide to be a really useful tool for us for, for detecting cervix uh, cancers. So if the screening test is abnormal, then people go on to what's called a colposcopy. And that colposcopy is sort of like a more um, involved look at the cervix. So we use special binoculars called a colposcope. Um, the PAP test itself takes a bit longer, you know, closer to sort of five minutes because we, we want a careful look. And then we actually apply vinegar um, to the cervix. And so what's interesting about these abnormal cells is that when the cells are infected and they take on some of these cellular changes, they lose some of that coating um, on the cervix. And so the, the vinegar actually makes it dry up 
more and it turns white for us. Um, and so um, that acetic acid's helpful and that helps the colposcopist, the doctor who's doing that sort of diagnostic test, that second test, to decide whether a biopsy is needed or that we're worried about what we're, um, we're seeing on the cervix. Um, in other developing countries, uh, and again, some folks who might be coming from other countries, you know, joining us in Canada, you know, may have actually had an acetic acid inspection as part of their screening test. So in some uh, low and middle income countries, you know, you're in their 30s, you get one uh, look and they put vinegar on and anything they see, they just treat on the spot. Um, even that, you know, sort of low cost, low technology um, treatment's been shown to reduce cervix cancer in some countries. But uh, here we only do that if uh, you need a diagnostic test. So if you go for colposcopy. Thank you for that clarification. And maybe we should take a brief pause now. You, I feel like I've done drinking from a fire hose here. You've given us uh, such a large amount of, of information to give our listeners a chance to kind of pause and hear a little bit about the Cancer Assistance Program. We'll be right back to talk further about cervical screening. We'd like to take a moment to thank our generous supporters, the Hutton Family Fund and Banco Creative Studio, who helped make the Cancer Assist podcast possible. The Cancer Assistance Program is as busy as ever, providing essential support to patients and their families. We remain committed to providing free services for patients in our community, including transportation and equipment loans, personal care and comfort items, parking, and practical education. These services are made possible by the generosity of our donors through one-time gifts, monthly donations, third-party fundraising, corporate sponsorships, and volunteer opportunities. Visit cancerassist.ca to see how you can make a difference in the lives of cancer patients and their families. Well, we're back with Dr. Krasasud and talking about cervical screening and uh, we've had a lot of information. Now let's just talk a little bit about um, what you do if you find uh, these abnormal cells. And you've said some of them are just kind of mildly abnormal and, and the other extreme, they're what we call high grade. They're, they're clearly looking like they're bad actors and yeah. they might go on to be a cancer, but they're not yet defined as a cancer because there's not evidence of invasion. Um, so what do we do? Because we're talking, this is prevention. Yeah. And, and not, it is treatment, but yeah. for an early stage. Yeah, exactly. So what's the process for Yeah, that's, that's great. So um, first thing that most colposcopists will do if they see a lesion that they're worried about is to do a biopsy. And, you know, the B word, you know, um, obviously it sounds really invasive, but um, these cells are very superficial. They don't really go very deep on the cervix. And so the biopsy we're taking is literally, you know, two millimeters, right? Smaller than a baby tooth. And whenever we do the biopsy, we always show patients and they're shocked at how little tissue we're taking. But because we only need, you know, about a millimeter of the thickness of that cervix to see whether those cells are there or not. Um, sometimes if we see a cervix that looks really abnormal or we're quite concerned, um, and sometimes if a patient we're worried might not be able to have follow-up. Uh, we live in a university town, so a good example might be someone who's here in our clinic but's going away, you know, on a placement or returning home, you know, for the summer, and, you know, we, we know we're just not going to get them back in the clinic. Um, or for someone where we know it takes a lot of bravery for them to even get to the hospital for a lot of reasons, and we just know that they, they really don't want to come back, we will occasionally treat at the same time. Um, and so if a treatment's required, that treatment's called a, a loop excision. Fancy name of it's called a loop excisional, uh, pr electrical excisional procedure or a leap. And so when people say loop, leap, all of these things um, in the... Um, UK, they call it a loop electrical excision transformation zone, so they call it elites. Um, they're all the same thing. So basically, uh, it's using electricity to take a, a larger part of the cervix off. And so, um, you know, again, going back to the donut analogy, you know, we're now taking a bite out of it. We're trying to, we're saying like, is this a donut or not? What flavor is this donut? What's going on um, inside? And so that's a short procedure that's done in the clinic setting. You're awake for it. We just put some freezing in the cervix. Um, and most patients really do not find it very difficult at all. Most patients are pleasantly surprised about how well it goes. For some patients, it can be a crampy procedure. Obviously, it's an uncomfortable procedure because it's a prolonged exam. So, you know, that speculum sits there for, again, you know, five, sometimes up to 10 minutes. Um, but what we're doing is we're taking about half to one centimeter of the end of the cervix, right at the, the part closest to the opening of the vagina um, off. Um, and with that, we can look for whether there's invasion or not, whether there's a cancer. Um, and we also cut out all of the abnormal cells. And so, you know, uh, these cells sort of spread, you know, neighbor to neighbor, right? They don't jump around very much. And so if we've removed all of it, there's a very good chance, in fact, that the cells will not return. 
um, afterwards. Um, after that treatment's done, uh, patients usually take the day off. Uh, a little bit of limitation in terms of you know lifting. We tend to recommend avoiding intercourse or straining for for a week or two, and then really back to life as normal. And then we follow them with follow up colposcopies after that. So it's fairly superficial. Do you, is it ever necessary to cut a, a, a deeper kind of cone of, of tissue yeah, away? And... Yeah. So that's changing a lot. And so some 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 listeners, uh, you know, might have had what's called a cone biopsy, or they might remember a time where they were put to sleep for the procedure. Um, it used to be that for certain lesions, we would we would do a cone biopsy. And and again, you know, if someone's had a treatment before and they're having a second treatment, we sometimes think it's safer to do that in the operating room. Um, but most patients actually do pretty well if the margins are are negative. So that means we sort of cut everything out, the recurrence rate is less than 5%. So less than 5% of patients will have a, another dysplasia that needs treatment. If those margins are positive, the treatment rate does go up closer to 10, 15%. So that's sort of a conceivable risk, right? About one in seven will need a second treatment at that time. Um, sometimes in a younger patient, even if the margins are positive, we might just watch them very closely um, to avoid a second treatment, um, you know, because we there are certain things we want to um, to prevent, um, which sort of dovetails into you know what are the risks of the procedure. So you know, cramping, discomfort, bleeding, obviously, you know, are the big ones. The one that we worry about is preterm birth, actually. So as you can imagine, if the cervix's mm -hmm. job is to keep a baby inside till we're ready to deliver, you know, removing we a small action. exactly yeah. could have an issue, and so. Um, thankfully, you know, we're removing the outer part of the cervix and it's that inner part of the cervix, the part that goes right up to the edge of the womb that really helps sort of retain the baby. That's really where, you know, the cervix kind of does its job. You know, the dilation, you know, of the upper part of the cervix is more important than the lower part. Um, studies have basically shown us that if you have an abnormal pap smear, you're at a very slight elevated risk of preterm birth. And whether you have one loop excision treatment or don't have a loop excision treatment, you probably have the same risk of preterm birth, about 8 to 10%. Um, but we know that if you do a deeper excision or if you do a second treatment, that that might increase the risk of preterm birth. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's another reason why, you know, other preventative strategies like HPV vaccination, you know, may also actually help improve other outcomes like, you know, reducing preterm birth. And in fact, you know, one of the studies in Australia where they had HPV vaccines, you know, in the population for longer is actually suggesting that maybe there's a reduction risk of preterm birth as well. So we're not just preventing cervical cancer, we're preventing the complications of the treatment and the prevention of it. I want to get to vaccination in a moment, but <clears throat> before that, it, it seems to me the guidelines for when women should start having uh, cervical screening and the frequency yeah. have been evolving a bit yeah. and uh, certainly different from when I trained. And maybe not to confuse people about what was the old way, what's, yeah. the, what's yeah. recommended yeah. today and why? Yeah, <laughs> so I tend to think about a sort of generational change, right? And, and part of it's our understanding of of what's going on, um, you know, the very, very original, you know, Papa Nicholas Smear really was looking for cervical cancer cells. And it, and it was only then they started to realize, oh, wait, these actually look for precancerous cells. And so, you know, that shift in the 1940s and 50s, even towards understanding how that test was used, you know, this is, this is a, an old test, you know, that has been around for a long time. So, you know, for listeners in their 60s, you know, you probably had your first screening test, you know, at a very young age, possibly in into your late teens, early 20s. Um, at that time, screening was a little bit less organized. Uh, you pretty much always got a pap smear as soon as you were pregnant, uh, regardless of age. And so, you know, there were this was what we call opportunistic screening. You'd kind of screen whenever, uh, whenever you could. Um, so at that time, you know, that was sort of what people did. If you're in your your 40s, like like I am, my generation, you know, um, you know, folks usually started getting screened around 21. Um, but still, at that time, people might have been screened at a younger age if they had a teen pregnancy or uh, if they were, exp you know, worried about kind of early. Um, early sexual debut we now really understand that our bodies are you know designed to fight these infections right and, and you know at the risk of being ageist the reality is our young immune systems are just better at clearing these infections right evolution kind of had a plan for all of this which was you know we'll, we'll kind of sort this stuff out now and then as we get older we were a little less good at fighting um, fighting these infections and what we call persistent in infections so so nowadays we actually recommend that that patients delay their first cervical screening test to the age of 25 um, if they don't have any other medical issues that might put them at increased risk of being what's called immunocompromised so you know individuals living with HIV uh, patients who maybe are on chemotherapy agents for example or have had treatment uh, where their immune systems are weakened um, those patients we recommend screening at 21. Um, but we really don't recommend anyone being screened uh, before then. We know that the very rare cervix cancers that happen in patients, you know, in their in their tweens, teens and very early 20s usually are not HPV related. They're the rare ones that don't get screened. 
Um, and when we look at the general population, you know, the risk of overtreatment of loop excision and the number of patients you'd have to both diagnose, screen and treat, you know, at potential risk really doesn't affect um, the overall rate of cervix cancer. So it's very, very rare um, before the age of 25. So the start date rec recommend, recommendation now, excuse me, is, is 25. Yeah. And, and then if it's a normal pap test, uh, yeah. it's the frequency. Yep, yeah. every, every three years. Three years. Yeah, three years until the age of 69. So once you get your 70th birthday, if you've had normal screening in the last 10 years, um, then you're good to stop. Yeah. And if you have some mild degree of abnormality, yeah. do you do it more frequently? Yeah. Right? Yeah, that's a good question. So there's a couple of different reasons you might be screened more often. And so um, most abnormal pap smears are actually are what are called low-grade changes. The, the two fancy words we use are ASCUS or LCL, and basically they just mean you have two of the three abnormal cell changes or you have three of the three abnormal cell changes that would suggest low-grade infection. And those low-grade ones, as I sort of said before, could be a low-risk HPV strain or a high-risk. We don't know because we're not testing for it at this time routinely. Um, we recommend that those patients get rescreened um, in one year. And about um, 40 to 50% of those patients actually will resolve on their own, not needing any treatment. That's why we, we give the body a bit of time. Um, if someone's had an HPV test done, uh, they've paid for it, or they, they're in a system where perhaps it had been offered to them, and that test is positive, we do recommend at this point um, screening on an annual basis. And then for patients that you know are quite significantly immunocompromised, they have a diagnosis of, of AIDS, for example, where there's an effect on their CD4 counts, or they're taking uh, you know very strong immune modulating drugs, we often those patients are screened every year as well. Now, how, how is uh, cervical screening organized in Ontario? Because breast screening, we know we have screening centers. Uh, yeah. um, we have a mechanism of alerting people to the need for colorectal uh, screening by letters going out starting at age 50. Uh, and, and with cervical screening, it's been done in family doctor's offices or when people see their yeah. obstetrician gynecologist. Yeah. And yeah. it's always seemed in the past to be less organized, yeah. you say. And I know that you're giving leadership to the program in, in Ontario. So how are we trying to make sure that we're getting everybody who should yeah. be in a screening program into it? That's great. Yeah. So the, the first iteration of the, the Ontario Cervical Screening Program or the OCSP started in 2000, actually. And so it's it's been an iterative process. Um, you know, we're, we're mindful of the delicate nature of, of cervical cancer, you know, cervical cancer screening, talking about a cervix, you know, all of these things. Um, and it's been a little bit slower to get towards, you know, a completely organized system, but we're, we're definitely moving in that, um, in that direction. So um, many um, individuals will know that they often get a letter um, in the mail starting at 25 to invite them to participate in the screening program and they do get a results letter similar to uh, for breast results. Um, they also get recall reminders when they're due for their next uh, screen and and you know so for people who kind of wonder you know how does the ministry know what's going on with my cervix I think also important to remember you know this is aggregate data it's database driven it, it's based on on kind of just knowing what's happening at the population level no one's individually pulling up your medical record and writing you a personal letter you know they are they are form letters but you know but but it's done so that it's in an organized way so that we're not missing um, people. You know, uh, we are going to be moving in the next couple of years towards um, what's called HPV testing as the primary screening test. And with that, you know, as the test changes, there's some real opportunities to improve the way the data is collected, the databases where that information is shared so that we're not missing, you know, PAPs that might be done in a, in a hospital where they don't upload into the system um, or where, uh, you know, somebody for whatever reason is moving and we don't have easy access to them. Um, you know, the healthcare system is always at a bit at the behest of, the, of privacy legislation, which is important. Obviously, I, I mean, I, I don't need, you know, the minister knowing what's going on with my individual health, although I'm sure she's a lovely person and would care deeply, you know. But I think the issue is that um, we also do know that not everyone opens their mail and not everyone stays in the same place, you know, over time. Um, so, you know, as privacy legislation changes, and I think that's going to accelerate with the pandemic, you know, Hopefully, eventually, we move to a system where you know all Ontarians can access their healthcare information, you know, a bit more uh, using mobile technologies. You know, and once we eventually get there, you know, we can use programs like the OCSP to notify you know patients of that. So we kind of work within the system that we um, that we have. Um, but more to come in terms of kind of you know better accuracy of of our, you know testing data, knowing that you've had your screen, and knowing how to follow up with it um, soon.
And at a high level, how are we doing in Ontario? Are we doing a pretty good job of getting most people screened uh, according to guidelines? We're doing as well as many other programs, but there's a lot of room for improvement. So so globally, really, no program can can ever really achieve the sort of 85% threshold that we're, we're looking for. And when we, we talk globally about sort of eradication goals, this idea that can we actually make cervix cancer a rare disease and, and get rid of the darn thing, we kind of use this sort of 80-80-80 rule, which is if we vaccinate 80% of the population, we screen 80% of the population, and we treat 80% of those abnormal cells, we'll get there, right? Um, so with the pandemic, obviously, you know, we're into year three of the pandemic. The, the cadence of this test is every three years. We know there's been a dropout rate. Um, and so unfortunately right now, you know, we used to sit around two thirds of the population being up to date for, for cervical cancer screening. We're only at about 50%. Um, 85% is where we want to get. The UK has skirted that number before, but, you know, even in highly organized screening programs, we know we still miss about one in six, one in seven percent of the population. Um, sometimes that's because they're not actually eligible, right? They maybe never have been sexually active or they've had a hysterectomy or, you know, and, and we just don't have that data to know kind of that they don't need the screening test. Um, sometimes it's because the test is done, you know, in a hospital lab. So the ministry doesn't see those results to know that it's been done. Um, but we know that, you know, most people are um, overdue for screening. A, a simple rule I have in my head is, you know, everyone remembers when the pandemic started. Everyone knows where they were, you know, March 12th, 13th, 2020. I was supposed to go to Disney and that didn't happen. <laughs> but, you know, if you haven't had a pap test since the pandemic started, you're due now. Due, yeah. Right. And so just keep it simple. Make an appointment. Go get checked out. Imagine one of the barriers, though, is just sort of the embarrassment mm-hmm. of going. It's just, it's just a test that I can't imagine many women look forward to. No. I I've, have heard of self-testing. Is that even a possibility? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And so, so technology, you know, now with HPV does allow us to, to you know, s- sample HPV in the same way we would sample, you know, uh, for chlamydia, gonorrhea. I mean, they're, they're literally the same swabs that we use even for COVID testing, right? They're just Q-tips that can be put in any part of the body to look for certain viruses. The current test is cytology, and that's looking for cervical cells. Um, There is some literature to show that a self-collected sample is a little bit sort of inelegant. It's uncomfortable because of the the brush you have to use, and it doesn't produce as as good a result. Um, And even for HPV, you know, when we get to that 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 test, you know, we're we're committed to looking at self sampling, you know, but a provider collected sample is still um, the best strategy. Uh, when we look at countries where self sampling is available, um, uh, the Netherlands is a common example. I think people need to sort of understand how that system is built. So, you know, a provider collected sample. So, going to your doctor, midwife, uh, nurse practitioner, you know, to get the test is the preferred option. And then, if you have, if you're overdue for screening, they mail you a kit. So, so even there, we recognize it's not the best option, but it's the it's the next best thing. Um, and so, you know, I think it's important people, you know, know what's going on with their health. I think it's really important. You know, as we move towards the ability to order things online, you know, getting testing, getting screened, that people really understand kind of what is the task asking, what does the test mean, and that the people who kind of facilitate those tests are ready to answer the questions, you know, about it. Um, it's sort of exciting. I mean, I, I, I actually, you know, as a harm reductionist at heart, you know, somebody really believes in autonomy. I think it's it's wonderful people are taking charge of their bodies, but I think, you know, the first step in that is really to have that conversation you know, with the provider, what can we do to make the procedure easier, you know, safer, less embarrassing? You know, what can we do to help if if you're not sure about whether, you know, you're eligible or want to have the test done? I think, I still think, you know, in my heart of hearts as a physician, you know, the onus is on us as healthcare providers to make the test the, the most positive or least negative experience possible, right? Um, but, you know, we need to hear from patients. We need to know why they're not ready, why they're struggling. Um, and we don't know a lot about that. You know, it's an area where we need to actually kind of raise the voice of the underscreen and understand that better and listen. Well, certainly there's a whole issue of health literacy. And, you know, going back to the ba- yeah. basics of this podcast, you know, what's a cervix? Yeah. And where is it? And, and how it becomes infected by a particular virus that yeah. could go on to produce a cancer. And hopefully the podcast is uh, yeah, one of many ways that people can get information and, and uh, become more aware and, and perhaps that's the motivation to go and, and get screened. But let's uh, now just take a look at vaccination mm-hmm. because this is a virus and we can vaccinate people for various viruses and then that's an even neater sounding preventive strategy. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure it's 100% effective, but tell me, yeah. when should people get vaccinated? Is it both boys and girls? Yeah. Is it uh, 
Um, I don't know, just uh, is it effective? Yeah, that's, that's a question. great question. So the best time to get vaccinated for HPV is before your first HPV exposure, which is why we pick such a young age for people to be vaccinated. And so you know, we were currently vaccinating in Ontario, you know, all kids, boys and girls at the uh, age of uh, 12 to 13 in grade seven. Okay. Uh, and it's two doses that they get. At, uh, dose zero, we call it. So the do dose you get today and then the next dose six months apart. Um, it's been shown that young immune systems are really good at mounting a response to um, these uh, vaccinations, to these vaccines, and that they have, you know, at this point, we think lifelong protection, that they don't need further boosters later on in life. Um, if you wait till after 15, you know, uh, just based on kind of what the literature would tell us, and for anyone who's getting, you know, a vaccine now, maybe because they're being treated or, or they just want to reduce their risk, you need to have a full three doses just because our immune systems as we get older just aren't quite um, as robust. Um, we vaccinate boys and girls for a couple of reasons. We vaccinate uh, boys and girls, one, because we want that concept of herd immunity. So you want to vaccinate anybody. Um, by vaccinating boys, you know, we do protect the unvaccinated girls if they are exposed to a vaccinated partner. And for people who who aren't sure who they're going to be with in relationships in the future, we still reduce those risks. Um, and for boys, we reduce the risks of anal cancer, penile cancers, and head and neck cancers um, later on. Um, but the effectiveness of the vaccine does drop off. So, you know, once once people are getting vaccinated in their 20s and 30s, you know, we're now maybe only reducing that risk by about 60%, but we're reducing that risk in, in these young people by well over 90% of, of developing a high-risk HPV infection. And so um, they're, really, uh, they're really good. They're really well-tolerated. Uh, people always kind of think HPV is interesting because it's a sexually transmitted infection vaccine, you know, and it's a vaccine for cancer. And, you know, this is all really new, but, you know, people actually forget is hepatitis B vaccine also prevents the development of liver cancers. And hepatitis B is also sexually transmitted. It can be transmitted other ways, you know, but uh, again, you know, we, we generationally, you know, have, we, we know as public health providers, you know, you vaccinate people before their exposures, however those exposures happen. Um, and so we, we want to do it at a, at a young age. These vaccines are safe, um, well studied in many, many countries. Um, and, you know, we're kind of in the middle of the pack in terms of, you know, when Ontario adopted um, HP vaccination. We weren't the first. We're not the guinea pigs by any means. You know, we're not the last. The others are catching up to us, which is good. But you know, we can be reassured about that, right, that, that, you know, our kids aren't test subjects or anything like that. Because certainly there are people in society who worry about vaccine and attribute mm -hmm. uh, possible other illnesses yeah. to vaccination. So it's important to know that it is safe, that there's not a connection to autism or whatever yeah. people are concerned about. So uh, that's a really important point. Um, wow, I think we've covered an awful lot of uh, <laughs> material here that should be very helpful to people who are listening. So I, I, um, I can't think of any more questions to ask you today. Oh, that's so, good. So I think we should close out today's podcast and maybe in the course of doing that, just remind listeners that we've done a lot of podcasts through the Cancer Assistance Program and they're available on the website, so at cancerassist.ca. I think there's about 40 podcasts and they cover a wide variety of uh, tumor types, uh, types of treatment, uh, supportive care services available here in, in Hamilton. So if, if you're in the situation of uh, being in the cancer journey or you're supporting someone who is, you may find something of help amongst those uh, podcasts that we've done in the past. But I do want to thank our listeners uh, today for tuning in and Dr. Kostescu for sharing his expertise in cervical yeah. screening. It's been great having you. My absolute thank pleasure. You. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Cancer Assist Podcast. Find more episodes, resources, and information at cancerassist.ca or follow the Cancer Assistance Program on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you next time.